The Wisdom of Solomon Number 1. The Ultimate Judge of Character Solomon succeeded King David as the final king of the unified nation of Israel. Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom at Gibeon, the most famous high place. God began the proceedings by appearing to Solomon and making an incredible offer. What should I give you? Solomon's response demonstrated that, in some ways, he was wise beyond his years. When he became king, he was about 20 years old. The young man was aware of his shortcomings. He had no previous leadership experience, but had been appointed ruler of many people. What he required was a receptive heart to judge and lead them correctly. Realizing your desperate need for God is the first step toward becoming a kingdom man. God was so pleased that Solomon requested wisdom rather than long life or riches that he granted the request and added to it what Solomon did not ask for, riches, honor, and a long life. However, for these promised blessings to become a reality, Solomon would have to walk in the ways of the Lord and obey his statutes and commands. God's promises were sure, but they could only be obtained through obedience. The author of 1 Kings intended the story in this section to demonstrate the profound wisdom God had bestowed upon Solomon. It helps us see that wisdom is more than acquiring knowledge and understanding. Wisdom, on the other hand, is spiritual understanding applied to earthly living. God had given Solomon intelligence and the ability to see the world through a spiritual lens and use that lens to everyday life. The king acted as Israel's one-man supreme court, serving as the final level of appeal in difficult cases. This particular case involved a quandary between two prostitutes. Each of them had given birth to a child. The first woman claimed that the second woman's child died as a result of her sleeping on him. The second woman then placed her dead son next to the first woman and took her living son for herself while it was still dark. When the first woman awoke to find her child dead beside her, she realized he wasn't her son. The second woman vehemently denied it, claiming the exact opposite. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 23-26, through 26, New King James Version And the king said, The one says, This is my son who lives, and your son is the one dead. And the other says, No, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Then the king said, Bring me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king, and the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son, and she said, O oh my lord, give her the living son, and by no means kill him. But the other said, Let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. Without the assistance of a DNA test, the average judge would be perplexed by the case. Solomon, on the other hand, knew exactly what to do because of his God-given insight into the ways of human nature. He said to divide the living boy in half and distribute half to each woman. And, just as the king predicted, the baby's true mother begged for his life and was even willing to give him up. The other woman cruelly seconded the king's decision. Then the king gave his ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is the mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. Solomon gave the living baby to the first woman after his unique solution to the dilemma was rewarded. The story quickly spread throughout Israel and everyone was in awe of the king because they saw God's wisdom in him to carry out justice. Solomon's reputation as the wisest man who ever lived spread quickly, bringing God glory. Number two, he was a prolific writer. Solomon became what we would call a Renaissance man as a result of God's blessing. There was no subject in which he did not possess unrivaled wisdom. He was a proverbial author, a song composer, and even a botanist and zoologist. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 32 and 33, New King James Version. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees, from the cedar tree of Lebanon even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. Solomon penned the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and a large portion of Proverbs. His wisdom far surpassed that of all the people of the East, and all of Egypt's wisdom was significant because these regions were renowned for their wisdom. The author of Kings stated unequivocally that there was no comparison.
Solomon was wiser than anyone. Furthermore, Solomon's reputation was well known. The surrounding nations came to know and respect Israel's king. Every king on the planet dispatched emissaries to hear Solomon's wisdom. God's kingdom was blessing the kingdoms of the world. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 through 34, New King James Version. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman, Shalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also he spoke of trees, from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Number 4. His Great Reputation It was typical of a king to send emissaries to Solomon. However, this queen came to confirm the words she had heard. The fame of Solomon had spread quickly. The story of the Queen of Sheba exemplifies this point. It also demonstrates that God was blessing the world's peoples through His people, just as He had promised Abraham. The Queen of Sheba paid a visit to Solomon's court. She was from an Arabian kingdom in what is now Yemen. Her country was about 1,200 miles from Jerusalem. The queen came to see Solomon because of his fame associated with the name of the Lord, which was most likely a reference to the wisdom that the Lord had bestowed upon him. She came to put him to the test with riddles to see if his abilities lived up to his reputation. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1, New King James Version. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She wasn't exactly a pauper herself, bringing a large entourage of expensive and exotic gifts with her. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 2, New King James Version. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. But Solomon's wisdom and wealth were far beyond her comprehension. It took her breath away by the time she had heard his explanations and seen his glorious kingdom. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 3-5, through 5, New King James Version. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. The visiting queen admitted that she had not believed the reports about Solomon that she had heard, but she'd seen for herself that he was the real deal. She then thanked the Lord for putting Solomon on the throne for the sake of Israel. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 6-8, through 8, New King James Version. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half was not told to me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men, and happy are these your servants, who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. She also lavished Solomon with gifts, and he appears to have reciprocated. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 9-13, through 13, New King James Version. Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord has loved Israel forever, therefore He made you king, to do justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices in great quantity, and precious stones. There never again came such abundance of spices as the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Also the ships of Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, brought great quantities of almug wood and precious stones from Ophir. And the king made steps of the almug wood for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, also harps and stringed instruments for singers. There never again came such almug wood, nor has the like been seen to this day.
Now King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired, whatever she asked, besides what Solomon had given her according to the royal generosity. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. An interesting insight into the Queen of Sheba is that she did not take people at face value, whether that be on the basis of their self-reports or the reputation that they had garnered from other people. In other words, she wanted to see the results for herself. Another interesting thing the Queen of Sheba demonstrated was that she did not share any of her gifts with Solomon or attempt to strike a closer relationship with him until she was satisfied that he deserved them. Later, Jesus mentioned the Queen of Sheba, also called the Queen of the South, in his condemnation of the scribes and Pharisees. Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. She was willing to travel hundreds of miles to hear Solomon's wisdom. But while the Son of God far exceeded Solomon in wisdom and glory, the Jewish religious leaders only scoffed at him. According to Jesus, at the final judgment, the Queen of Sheba will point her finger at them in condemnation. They will have no excuse for having rejected the Messiah. Number five, he built the great temple without making a sound. Perhaps Solomon's most famous act was the construction of the temple with materials and plans provided by his father David. God had promised David that he would allow his son to build the first permanent place of centralized worship as predicted centuries before in the book of Deuteronomy. It was a magnificent temple and took seven years to build. It took 12 years to build Solomon's palace, however. Although the temple was constructed out of cut stone, the sound of hammer and chisel was never heard. Thus, the temple was erected silently. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, New King James Version. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. For many years, this remained a mystery until someone discovered a massive cave the size of a large theater on Mount Moriah near Calvary outside Jerusalem. Millions of small chips cover the floor where the rock has been cut. The rock is so soft that it can be cut with a penknife, but when exposed to air, it oxidizes and becomes quite hard. All of the stones for the temple came from this cave where they cut the blocks to fit into the temple above ground. His reign brought great prosperity to the Israelites. The empire stretched from Egypt to the Euphrates and included most of the territory promised to them. The Book of Kings, chapter 6, contains a detailed description of the layout of the temple. They can be pretty intricate and technical at times, making it difficult to gain a clear picture of the situation. Nevertheless, we are aware that the construction of the temple followed something like the following. It measured a length of 90 feet with a width of 30 feet and a height of 45 feet. All the lumber and stone for the temple was finished at the quarry to exact specifications so that when brought to Jerusalem, the pieces could be fitted together without iron tools. Nothing but gold was visible inside the temple. In front of the temple was the inner court of the priests. There was a low wall between it and the outer court. This wall consisted of three rows of hewn stone and a row of cedar beams. In the inner court was a huge brazen altar for sacrifices. The outer court was for the people of Israel. The temple was begun in the fourth year of Solomon's reign and was finished seven years later. The images are sometimes grander than we can imagine. The enormous bronze laver that stood in the inner court was known as the Sea of Cast Bronze. The bronze articles were cast in clay in much the same manner as is done today. The furnishings of the holy place included the golden altar of incense, the table of gold, ten golden tables of showbread, ten golden lampstands of pure gold, and golden utensils. Solomon was also in charge of the temple's dedication. His dedicatory prayer, which is based on Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, is detailed in Kings. It mentions God's promise to return His people from exile if they return to Him, a promise that became especially important for those in Babylon when the book was published. Solomon was aware that there was no building on earth that could house the great God, but he still prayed that the Lord would recognize this temple and that whenever he or anyone from Israel addressed God there, he would hear and forgive them. 
This enormous celebration was marked by happiness as well as worship and expressions of gratitude. Not a single one of the thousands of animals was brought before the Lord as a sacrifice for sin or trespass. The cost of the construction of Solomon's temple was not less than $30 million, according to the estimate of Professor Ignaz Alfred Grody of Breslau. The temple, built by King Solomon, was constructed mainly of Egyptian materials and was completed not earlier than 1000 BC, according to the professor's conclusions. King Solomon constructed the temple with great skill, sparing no expense and paying careful attention to every detail. Even the invisible parts were finished to a high standard of quality and accuracy by him. Solomon's reputation spread far and wide, and the magnitude of his power grew substantially as a result of his building program.